A shooter takes deadly aim at the residents of a small Georgia town. Police and the FBI begin a desperate search to find the killer. They struggle to make sense of the evidence as the body count climbs, all in an attempt to stop this murderer before he puts his next victim in his sights. A series of bizarre shootings terrorized the small town. Two people were killed, two others were critically wounded. At first, the shootings seemed targeted, then they seemed random. I'm Jim Kalstrom, former head of the FBI's New York office. As the body count climbed, the killer taunted law enforcement with mysterious notes. Agents believed the shooter would continue to kill until he was dead or behind bars. East Point, Georgia is just seven miles south of Atlanta. It's a quiet city with a population of 40,000. East Point averages six to eight homicides a year. March 1st, 2001, a man is concerned about his mother. He arrives at her house to see if she's okay. He normally speaks to his mother by phone every day, but this day she did not answer his calls. Then he sees signs of foul play that lead to his mother's car. He makes a horrific discovery. Minutes later, East Point Police and Lieutenant Russell Popham begin a homicide investigation. We discovered the victim was a female that had been shot uh, when she was dead of multiple gunshot wounds. We did notice that uh, she had been there for about 24 hours. Police can already rule out one reason why the victim was murdered. As always in any kind of crime, you try to figure out the motive, but Obviously, her car was still there as well as her pocketbook. So we didn't think at the time that robbery was a motive. Detectives identify the victim as Pamela Clark. They also find a badge. The victim was a probation officer with the state of Georgia. She worked for the Department of Corrections, and she supervised probationers. Since they have limited investigative resources, East Point Police request the FBI and the Georgia Bureau of Investigation to assist at the crime scene. FBI Special Agent Pete McFarlane is on a task force that assists local police departments with forensic analysis. A lot of the local police departments did not have the equipment such as Luma lights. We actually process uh, vehicles for latent fingerprints. We process items that we pick up for latent fingerprints. Agent McFarlane finds signs Pamela Clark was shot at almost point-blank range. You could see where the person had shot right through the window, and glass had actually impaled the victim's uh, face. So it was very close. I guess you could say it was an execution. The killer was both brutal and careful. East Point Police Detective Bobby Gray finds no bullet shell casings at the scene, despite multiple shots being fired. No shell casings could mean that there was a revolver. Till we know differently, we're going to assume either the person picked him up or he was using the revolver. Police believe the killer premeditated the murder because of the lack of evidence. There was no fingerprints left at the scene. It was a very sterile scene. Detectives want to know who would want Pamela Clark dead. For answers, they turn to the victim's son, 
He spoke to his mother every day. But she seemed happy and never mentioned trouble with anyone, including her probationers. To investigators, it seems that the fatal shooting was a random attack. That night, detectives go door to door throughout the neighborhood. They're searching for anyone who saw anything suspicious in the last 24 hours. They find only one witness. He was in the shadow then. And, um... The previous night, she heard noises that could have been gunshots. Then she saw someone calmly walking away. The witness said she saw a, a black male about six foot tall. She's looking at a distance from about 40 yards, so she can only tell that he had a low haircut. And uh, he was about six foot tall of uh, average build. There was not much light. That's all she could come up with. We got you. Tell me anything or some thoughts in your mind. Just give us a call. Unfortunately, the witness is unsure she'd recognize the man if she saw him again. The medical examiner confirms several findings investigators made at the crime scene. Pamela Clark was murdered 24 hours before her body was discovered. The medical examiner identifies four bullet wounds, three to the left side of the torso and one near the right armpit area. The tight grouping of the three wounds is consistent with police theories that the killer shot the victim at close range. Police get their first clues about the murder weapon when the medical examiner removes three 40 caliber bullets from the body. Although three bullets are recovered, the victim had four gunshot wounds. Investigators recover the fourth bullet from the passenger seat of the victim's car. It's also 40 caliber. Agents find the vehicle unusually cluttered with junk mail, bills, and other letters. The victim's son said his mother usually sorted her mail in the car after she picked it up from her mailbox. Agents also note a few other items. I thought she may have had some children in the car because there were some wrappers also in the vehicle. Based on the evidence recovered from the car, the autopsy, and witness interviews, Detectives put together a murder scenario that paints a picture of a ruthless, calculating assailant. Investigators suspect the killer was lying in wait as Pamela Clark arrived home on the evening of February 28, 2001, at about 7.30 p.m. It seems he was familiar with his victim's routine as she arrived home from work. There he'd have a captive target as she sorted her mail. Detectives believe the killer either picked up all the 40 caliber shell casings or had some other way of containing them as he fired. Then he left Pamela Clark to die. Police have a theory on how the victim was murdered, but they have no suspects and a killer on the loose. We have an extreme whodunit. We have bullets, we have a car, and we have a body. And that's about all we have. With so little to go on, it will be difficult to find justice for the murdered probation officer. East Point, Georgia police and the FBI have a killer on the loose, a killer who murdered probation officer Pamela Clark. They have no leads and no suspects. They only know the killer approached her while she sat in her car, then shot her four times at close range with a 40 caliber handgun. Investigators like East Point Police Lieutenant Russell Popham try to understand why someone would want Pamela Clark dead. There's an old saying that if you can establish the motive, you can solve the crime. We immediately went to work on her immediate family, her, her contacts, as well as her job as a state probation officer. The victim's son said she never mentioned having any enemies. 
Detectives focus on the victim's job as a probation officer, where she worked with dangerous criminals on a daily basis. A probation officer has the power to send a violent criminal back to jail. Okay, here's her office. All right. Just look around, and uh, if you need me... Police search the victim's office to examine her case files. She had a typical caseload of um, anywhere from 70 to 100 probationers. So we looked to see if there was anybody on her probation list that maybe she was about to try and revoke the probation. This took about uh, 15 days to, to go through the list. Detectives question each of Pamela Clark's probationers to find out where they were on the night she was killed. Yeah. Debra, I'd like to talk to you. Uh, about? You familiar Miss Clark? She's your probation officer. Yeah. Do you know what happened to her? Uh, no. Most of them are saddened to hear of her murder. Murdered? Yes. Where were you the night she was murdered? And she's like... She's like a mom to me and everything. I mean... What we found in interviewing her probationers is that she was a well-liked person, a very fair person, almost a mother figure. We heard that from several people that had committed some violent crimes, and uh, they, they actually liked her as a probation officer. I'm going to go out of town. I'm not leaving town. Well, I'm going to be back and talk with you some more, okay? All right, no problem. But as police scour hundreds of case files, they discover a probationer who had both a motive to kill Officer Clark and the opportunity to study her habits. We were able to find one person that uh, she was potentially going to revoke her or ask for his probation to be revoked because he uh, had uh, failed a drug test. And this person uh, actually lived in her neighborhood. The probationer's name is Thomas Moulton. Detectives put a mugshot of Moulton into a photo lineup. They show it to the witness who saw a man walking away from the crime scene on the night of the murder. The witness identifies Thomas Moulton as the man she saw. With the positive ID, it seems investigators may have an open and shut case. March 15, 2001, two weeks after Pamela Clark was gunned down. Police have an arrest and search warrant for Moulton. Your hands. What's wrong? What did I do? During their search of Moulton's house, investigators uncover a jacket like the one the witness saw on the night of the murder. This looks like the jacket. Yeah, it sure does, doesn't it? That's it. Police also make a disturbing find. He had a box of uh, nine millimeter bullets in his room. And uh, we knew, however, that the bullets used were 40 caliber. But again, this showed that uh, this probationer had, had bullets when he shouldn't have. We were alarmed at this. We still had a lot of work to do to prove or disprove that this person did it. Thomas Moulton submits to a polygraph test and agrees to be questioned without a lawyer present. Did you kill Pamela Clark? No. Under questioning, Moulton denies any involvement in Pamela Clark's murder. No. He claims to have respected her, even though her probation report would send him back to prison. Did you have anything to do with Officer Clark's murder? No. I wouldn't hurt her. I liked her. She was good to me. He explains that the bullets found in his apartment were for a Smith & Wesson 9mm pistol. The weapon was stolen six months earlier. Did you ever use the path in Officer Clark's backyard? Yes, but everybody used that path. When investigators press Moulton for an alibi, he claims he can't remember where he was on the night of Pamela Clark's murder. The night of February 28, 2001? No. 
Have you been truthful in all your responses during this interview? Yes. Throughout the interview, the polygraph analyst detects no evidence of deception by Moulton. This is over, relax. Is that a fan? Police later examine Moulton's telephone records. They discover Moulton was on the phone talking to his girlfriend during the time Pamela Clark was murdered. Detectives clear Moulton as a suspect. They've hit a dead end in their investigation. The killer is still on the loose and free to strike again. April 8th, 2001, over a month after Pamela Clark was murdered. It's an unusually warm spring evening in East Point. It was a night in the uh, low 70s at the time, so a lot of people were, enjoy really, were enjoying the first uh, uh, few days of spring that, uh, with their doors open, their windows open. A few miles from Pamela Clark's home, a retiree named Chuck Boiler hears someone approach. Who's out there? The bullet shatters the man's arm and rips into his chest. He tries to fight back, but he's rapidly losing blood. The gunman lingers. Then disappears into the night. East Point Police Lieutenant Russell Popham tries to get a description of the assailant. But it's no use. He couldn't tell if it was a man or a woman, uh, the race of the person or anything. And we asked him, well, who would have did this to you? Did they ask for anything? Did they try to rob you or anything like that? And he said, no, I just went to the door and I was shot through the door. Detectives find evidence confirming the victim was shot at almost point-blank range. We could actually see the gunpowder residue around the screen, so we knew, again, this was up close and personal. And so it appeared that he was targeted. Police recover a shell casing. Detective, we got a shell casing over here. Yeah, it's 40 caliber. Then detectives find an unusual clue deliberately left behind by the shooter. It's an ominous note that reads, I was locked up for six weeks, someone must pay. The reverse side of the note is signed in yellow highlighter. The gunman calls himself Jack. As East Point police try to make sense of the note, they have no idea that more violence is being unleashed just a few miles away. Less than an hour after Chuck Boiler was shot, East Point police will have a new murder on their hands. Hey! Hey! You mind here? In the spring of 2001, police in East Point, Georgia, are investigating the murder of probation officer Pamela Clark. They have no suspects. Over a month later, a gunman shoots Chuck Boiler point blank, shattering his arm. Police find a note left by the shooter in which he calls himself Jack. Less than an hour after Chuck Boiler was shot, a man approaches another house in East Point. The man isn't a shooter, he's a victim. East Point Emergency Services raced to their second shooting of the night. Police learn the victim's name is Andrew Wilson, a janitor at a local hospital. In a few hours, Wilson will die from gunshot wounds to his back. Police need to know what happened. They find answers down the street. car idles with no one inside. 
Police run the registration and learn the vehicle belongs to the victim. Investigators find bullet holes in the vehicle that indicate Wilson was shot in his car as he pulled up to the intersection. The fatal bullet likely passed through the driver's side rear window, through the back of the driver's side seat, and into the victim's back. After Wilson was shot, detectives believe he got out of his car and desperately searched the neighborhood for help. Police recover five shell casings from the scene. They're all 40 caliber. Just like the casing recovered an hour earlier in front of Chuck Boiler's house. But the fact that 40 caliber weapons were used in both crimes does not necessarily link the two shootings. The primary murder weapon that's used around here is a nine millimeter, and as the 40 caliber's gotten more popular, uh, we see a lot of 40 caliber crime scenes. Then police find undeniable evidence the two shootings are related. The city of East Point has a serial shooter on the loose. He calls himself Jack. I need to ask you some questions, okay? East Point police canvass the neighborhood for witnesses. Okay. Yeah, um, they find a woman who saw a black male loitering in the area before the shooting. She saw that uh, uh, this man standing there, and he was pacing back and forth. And she watched him for 10 or 15 minutes, and she said, this is not right. The witness phoned police to report the man. Yes, um, I was wondering if you could send out a, a patrol car to Fenton Brown. Yes, um, well, there's a man out here. I've never seen my neighbor. He's pretty scary, and... OK, thank you. When she went back to the window, she saw a car approach the intersection. She never saw the man's face, but she got a good look at his vehicle. She sees a late model American car. She was very adamant in detail about it. That was one thing that we really believed her on, that she knew what type of car it was. The witness was unable to see the car's license plate number. Okay, well, you, you've done good. Okay, if you think of anything, anything, okay. anything else comes to mind, okay? Would you, would you please give me a yeah. call? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> In a single night, Jack has murdered one man and seriously wounded another. Police now have two bodies on their hands and every reason to expect there will be more. The city of East Point, Georgia has a serial shooter on the loose. In a single night, the gunman wounded one man and killed another. Investigators found notes left by the shooter at both crime scenes. They were signed in yellow highlighter, Jack. East Point Police and Detective Bobby Gray fear the shooter will strike again. The frustrating thing about this investigation is we didn't know who, we didn't know why, and we didn't know who would be next. Four days later, on April 12, 2001, a shadowy figure approaches another house in East Point. A woman is unaware she's a target. She doesn't hear the shot. The TV is her only clue something is wrong. Then she spots a bullet hole and calls 911. East Point police respond to the latest shooting. Detectives believe the shooter targeted the woman and hit the TV by mistake. She's lucky to be alive. Did you hear anything prior to the shot? I didn't. I was sitting there watching TV, and I, I remember flipping through the magazine, and that's all I can remember. I'm sure. If it wasn't for the TV being in front of the window, the person watching the TV would have been dead. The bullet went through the window, went through the screen, went through the back of the TV, and fortunately, it lodged inside the TV. 
Investigators uncover a chilling note that supports their theory and threatens many more victims. It reads, better count your body bags. We knew that this person wasn't gonna stop. We're gonna have more victims. It's not a matter of if, it's a matter of when and how many. Police have no doubt as to who did the shooting. The killer who calls himself Jack. Hours later, crime scene technicians recover a bullet from the woman's TV set. It's 40 caliber, consistent with Jack's MO. East Point detectives need to stop Jack before he makes good on his threat to fill body bags with more victims. They appeal to other police agencies and the FBI for help. FBI Special Agent Pete McFarlane examines the evidence. He recognizes the notes. He found one when he processed the car of murdered probation officer Pamela Clark. At first, he thought the note was just a child's scribbling. But now, it ties Pamela Clark's murder to the shooting spree. This is it. I knew I'd seen it. Eureka. That's the word you want to use, Eureka. There's a connect here. When you started connecting all of them together, it's very similar handwriting or block writing, all done with a, a highlighter. It was almost like this person was trying to say that, well, I'm a serial killer. I'm, I'm out there shooting people just for no reason at all. The similarities between the notes point to a killer that is methodical, calculated, and consistent. Jack wrote each note on a half a sheet of standard white paper. Jack tore each note by hand, resulting in ragged edges. And Jack signed each note with either an orange or a yellow highlighter. Detectives believe one note contains a possible motive. I was locked up for six weeks for nothing. Someone must pay. So investigators scour records for anyone recently jailed for that period of time named Jack. They find no viable suspects. Jack and his true motive remain a mystery. We as investigators had four crime scenes, and, uh, but we had nothing. Uh, we had no suspects, we had nobody. Police examine the victim's backgrounds, searching for any link between them that could show a pattern in the shootings. We even went as far as to the individuals, do they have their oil changed at the same place? You know, their, their car, their automotive work, was it done at the same place? Uh, uh, things like that. I mean, we looked into every possible avenue of, of, to connect them, uh, to disprove that it was random. The only link police find is that all the victims live within the borders of the same city. Everything was centered in East Point as opposed to the shooter going to College Park, which is right next door to East Point, or even back to Atlanta, or to Hapeville, or some other uh, jurisdiction in close proximity to East Point. Everything was centered right in East Point. Detectives know that when the killer strikes again, it will be in East Point. Anyone within city limits could be a target. Police take unprecedented measures to warn the public. They use a computer system to dial every phone number in East Point. Anyone who picks up the phone hears a message warning about a killer on the loose. The taped message tells the public to call police if they see anything even slightly suspicious. It puts the entire city on edge. East Point police work around the clock, canceling leave and beefing up patrols to catch Jack before he strikes again. But they're up against a gunman who kills at a time and place of his choosing. We felt helpless. 
we're here to protect the citizens of East Point and we're here to help. And unfortunately, you don't know when the next shooting's gonna happen. You don't know who's gonna be the victim. You don't know why they're gonna be a victim. Investigators fear they're playing a grim waiting game with Jack. I can remember a veteran uh, FBI agent that had worked on some serial murder cases, serial rapist cases, and he said, I'll never forget this, he said, you're probably just gonna have to sit back and wait for another one to happen. And that's not really what you wanna hear. Twelve days later, on April 24th, 2001, the wait is over. At 1.30 a.m., Rosa Lewis pulls up to her East Point apartment. She's Jack's fifth victim. East Point, Georgia, April 24th, 2001 at 1.30 a.m. Rosa Lewis has been shot in her car as she pulled up to her apartment. She's the latest victim in a series of random shootings that have left two people dead. She fights to avoid becoming the third murder victim. Despite four bullets that have ripped into the left side of her torso, calls 911 as Rosa Lewis loses consciousness. East Point Police, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, and the FBI speed to the scene. East Point Police Lieutenant Russell Popham can't get any answers from the victim. Not now, maybe never. What we were told was that she was not gonna live. We were told that she was that critical, her blood pressure was already dropping, that she wasn't gonna live. Investigators turned to the physical evidence left behind. Once again, they find 40 caliber shell casings, four of them. Detectives know the killer who calls himself Jack used a 40 caliber weapon in all four of his previous shootings. Agents find another clue on the roof of a car that the shooter used to steady his aim. But you could see the uh, where he actually reached across the roof and was laying across the roof of this vehicle, shooting into the vehicle. You could see the the V shape of the uh, of the muzzle blast on the car itself. The connection is this is so close. It's so close that this person could not miss. It's not like shooting from 25 feet, 50 yards away. This person got right up into the victim's face and was shooting that person. Police search for Jack's signature clue. We immediately began to look for a note. Uh, we had the 40 caliber casing, so we immediately began to look for a note. Uh, we could not find a note uh, in the darkness. We could find a note, and it, was, uh, it wasn't a windy night, so we didn't think the note had blown away, but we couldn't find it. Although no note is recovered, police find similarities between the Rosa Lewis shooting and the murder of probation officer Pamela Clark. Both women were gunned down in their cars with multiple shots fired through the driver's side window at close range. Then detectives uncover a shocking clue that changes the entire investigation. Rosa Lewis was a probation officer just like Pamela Clark. They knew each other. They worked in the same office together. This is too coincidental. Detectives no longer believe the shootings are random. Somehow the Rosa Lewis and Pamela Clark shootings are related. Police interview Rosa Lewis's roommate and learn Rosa moved into the apartment two months ago after a recent divorce. 
but she described the relationship to us as an amicable divorce. Uh, she even said that the victim's ex-husband had actually helped her move in. There was no reason to believe that he had a motivation to want to kill her. Agents and detectives go door to door, searching for any witnesses to the shooting. And we did find one lady who actually lives on a street uh, behind the apartment complex who said she heard the shot. Um, she looked out her window and she saw a car leaving that area. And she described it as a blue car and she gave us that it was similar to a particular make of a car. So we had now a car, the kind of car we're possibly looking for the make and model. We just weren't certain what the tag of the number was on the vehicle. The witness never saw the killer's face. Once again, police are left with only a vehicle description. Later that morning, police notify Rosa Lewis's family about the shooting, including her ex-husband, William Lewis. We knock on the door and nobody answers. Uh, we knock a few more times and we're about to leave. And as we turn around to walk to our car, a car pulls in uh, the first thing that we notice is that this car that pulled in was very similar, if not the same kind of car that was described leaving the shooting. The man driving the car is William Lewis. Detectives break the tragic news to him. Times. When we told him that his ex-wife had been shot multiple times and may die, he wasn't shocked. He didn't ask, how is she doing? He didn't say, I have to get to her. He didn't say, what are you doing to get this person? It's almost as if we had notified him that uh, uh, something that was not really that significant. Madam, you check your car? Come on. Detectives asked to search Lewis's car. He consents and says the vehicle is a rental. Hours after the shooting, police could expect to find a weapon, bullets, or a note signed in yellow highlighter if William Lewis is Jack. But they find nothing. Investigators then ask Lewis for consent to search his house. He agrees. The living room is clean, but it's only one of many rooms. Mr. Lewis, is that, uh, is that your bedroom back there? Yeah. Man of fact, take a look. In the bedroom, police find items that would be common in any home office. But in this case, they have a chilling significance. As I was standing in the bedroom, I looked over at his dresser, and on his dresser were several highlight markers. It was the same colors of the notes that we had had before. Mr. Lewis, would you mind uh, coming with us back downtown for a little while? Would you, I mean, just need to go in and ask a few more questions. Is that okay? Downtown? Yeah. The discovery prompts detectives to ask Lewis to come downtown for questioning. He agrees. I think he wanted to be as cooperative as he could. He wanted to convince us that he was not the person. Police have no way of knowing if they just put Jack in their car or if it's another dead end. Probation officer Rosa Lewis lies in a coma after being shot four times in the chest. Police believe she's the fifth victim of a serial shooter who calls himself Jack. Detectives find circumstantial evidence that points to the victim's ex-husband, William Lewis. But they still have no idea why he went by the name Jack or what prompted his shooting spree. While Lewis is transported to the police station for questioning, other investigators are dispatched to the probation office where his ex-wife, Rosa Lewis, worked. They search her desk for clues. It's the same office in which the first victim of the shooting spree, Pamela Clark, worked. The women were close friends. 
Investigators find evidence that Rosa Lewis feared for her life. Weeks before she was shot, she wrote a letter and placed it in her desk. It said if anything happened to her, it was her ex-husband who was responsible. From the letter, East Point Police Detective Bobby Gray learns William Lewis made threats to stop Rosa from divorcing him. He would tell her things like, I know people. I know people who can do things to you. I know how to get rid of you. And he would say things like, I will blow your head off. In her letter, Rosa Lewis also implicates her ex-husband in the murder of Pamela Clark. Pamela helped Rosa through the divorce and recommended a divorce lawyer. It made William Lewis furious. And in his mind, if she had not talked his wife into leaving him, his wife would still be with him. He was so mad at her that that was going to be the first person that he would lash out at. Pamela was murdered the night before Rosa left her husband for good. During questioning, detectives confront William Lewis with the note found in Rosa's desk. My ex-husband has been acting extremely irrational. Many people have cautioned me to be careful. Why and we actually read the letter to him in the interview and asked him about these threats that he was making. And he told us that those are just empty. So those are empty threats. Those are empty threats. There's nothing to that. They're empty. That's all empty threats. That's it. Threats. Yeah. Empty threat. Empty enough for her to write a letter to an attorney. It's just words. That's all it was, man. You ever grabbed your wife? No. You ever hit her? No. You ever beat her? No. They ask William Lewis more about his relationship with his wife. They learn the couple's wedding anniversary is April 8th, the same day Chuck Boiler was shot and Andrew Wilson was murdered. What we've theorized is he uh, had probably sitting at home all day on Sunday. It was his wedding anniversary. He wanted his wife, and we think he became angry and just went out and shot two random victims. Uh, can you explain these to us? Detectives review Lewis's credit card records and learn he rented a car on April 8th. No big deal. On the same day that the murder took place, the same car that was seen at the murder scene. You tell me about that. That's a coincidence. The car matches the description of the vehicle a witness saw leaving the Andrew Wilson murder scene. According to him, he liked to rent a lot of cars. We link him to two cars that he rented, and the two cars that he rented were both seen leaving shootings, and that was very important. He didn't see me. During the grueling three-hour interrogation, Lewis remains deceptive and evasive in his answers. He makes up stories about probationers who wanted to kill his ex-wife. Investigators see through the smoke screen. This was to show you got the right to remain silent and not make any statement at all. It was about 5 o'clock that day that uh, we placed him under arrest for, for shooting his wife. I love my wife, okay? But Rosa Lewis was only one of five people targeted by the shooter known as Jack. If William Lewis is Jack, Police still have to prove it. We had to connect him back to these other, these other incidents. We had a lot of circumstantial evidence, but we didn't feel at that time we had nowhere near enough to convict him. The good news is we had one survivor. She's recovering. FBI Special Agent Pete McFarland believes one way to link Lewis to the other shootings is through shell casings and bullets. No shell casing here. That was the first. Uh, victim two, one, we found. The lab said all the bullets from the previous crime scenes came from the same weapon. The bullets that shot Miss Lewis came from the same weapon. East Point Police Lieutenant Russell Popham knows locating the murder weapon will prove their case. We're lucky we have one survivor here. To this day, uh, we have never found the firearm. We executed uh, eight search warrants uh, looking for this firearm, and we have never found the firearm. It keeps coming up. There's got to be something. Um, the highlighters. Police seized the highlighters found in William Lewis's bedroom. Uh, he wrote these. He left these on every crime scene. He's trying to tell us something. It leads us to the markers he used. What about the highlighters? The oil. They're just your everyday, ordinary highlighter. I found them in Lewis's uh, bedroom. It's just a common <coughs> so it might not have anything to work with. Right. But they are a popular brand. 
Even if the ink matches the notes the shooter left behind, a jury could still have reasonable doubts. Wait a second. Wait one second here. Um, now look at this book. The notes themselves might, however, contain forensic evidence. Note, it's all the same, all the same, all the tears. Mm -hmm. Crime scene technicians dust the notes for fingerprints and find only unreadable smudges. They find some of the smudges along the torn edges were not made by fingers, but by human lips. We believe what happened was that this person had licked the piece of paper and tore, tore it off, moistened the paper, basically, and left his lip prints. With the paper moistened, it would be easier for the shooter to tear it along the fold. The shooter avoided leaving his fingerprints on the notes, but technicians find traces of saliva, saliva that contains DNA. Investigators compare DNA taken from the notes with a sample taken from William Lewis. The DNA matches. William Lewis is Jack. Even though we didn't have a murder weapon from him, we had his DNA. His saliva is on these notes, and they're at three of the scenes. William Charles Lewis is indicted on 26 counts in connection with the East Point shooting spree. The district attorney plans to seek the death penalty. William Lewis's ex-wife, Rosa, emerges from her coma after months of hospitalization and eventually returns home. In September 2001, five months after Rosa Lewis was nearly murdered, police respond to her home once again. Yes, I did. Miss Lewis called me, said, uh, I just got a letter. It's here. I haven't opened it. I want you to come down here and get it. And I went down there to, to where she was living and uh, picked up the letter and read it. Basically an apology to his wife. From the letter, detectives learned the bizarre motives behind the shooting spree. They knew that if he killed the first victim, uh, which was his wife's friends, it would bring a lot of hurt to his wife. The second victim, the third victim, the fourth victims were, uh, they were just to throw the police off. The letter closes all five cases and seals William Lewis's fate. Not only did we have his DNA at the scene, which was enough to convict him, but now we had a confession as to why he did it, and the reason and why he did it. With his confession written, William Lewis pleads guilty to all counts. He's sentenced to life in prison, plus 191 years with no possibility of parole. We all discussed that at one time. If he had not been caught, would he have gone on and started continued shooting people just to lead us away from the whole purpose is to kill his wife. You know, throw us off track. I suspect he probably would have gone on if he didn't get caught. Only William Lewis knows how many more random victims he would have killed to cover his tracks. The combined efforts of the East Point Police, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, and the FBI made sure he'd never get the chance to kill again.